Well, as we all know, the COVID pandemic has hit Southeast Asia very hard, as it has uh, all over the world, and many parts of the world, including Southeast Asia, are now reeling you know, from the uh, shock of the disruptions and the radical changes to everyday, ordinary life brought about by the restrictions that have to be imposed in order to contain this pandemic. Um, what I find interesting about uh, the pandemic apart from the actual problem of the virus spreading itself is the way in which this pandemic has been depicted um, in the media, you know, popular media and mainstream media, where more often than not we keep hearing the phrase, you know, unprecedented crisis or novel crisis, new crisis, new challenge being used uh, in media reports on um, the pandemic itself. Now I find this interesting because in a sense um, looking at it strictly from a sort of linguistic philosophical point of view one could argue that you know, radical newness uh, rarely if ever you know enters the world for something anything to be regarded as new in the first place it has already been somehow brought into the discursive economy of the known and the familiar so in a sense nothing is ra ever radically radically new nothing is radically outside our our discursive economy uh, of the of the known and the familiar so there's nothing terribly new about you know the crisis as we see it uh, today what I find interesting is uh, the fact that a lot of people have forgotten that in this part of the world, in Southeast Asia, you know, crisis has always been part of uh, public discourse in the popular public domain. Um, and yet, when one attempts a historical overview of the popular understandings of crisis um, as it has evolved over time, we see very clearly that historically crisis has never been seen as something that is fixed or ontologically given and fully present, fully constituted, arrested, you know, uh, out of you know, um, a historical time in a sense. Um, and for me, as someone who studies uh, the evolution of you know, political culture and political language in Southeast Asia, I'm struck by how successive generations of Southeast Asian thinkers and writers and intellectuals have always had to deal with crises um, in their, you know, life uh, periods in a sense. So in a sense a crisis is something generational. So looking back all the way to say the 17th century when we uh, read the writings of um, Bukhara al-Jahari uh, who's known for his uh, text, the Tash of Salatin, the Crown of Kings, written in 1603. Already even then we can see how Bukhara al-Jahari articulated a particular understanding of crisis as he understood it, you know, in the context of early 17th century maritime Southeast Asia. For al-Jahari, crisis was basically a state of breakdown in communication when the ruling elites are disconnected from the masses that they govern or rule over and for him this absence of communication or the breakdown of communication meant that the ruling system no longer mirrored or reflected the society it was meant to manage and govern so crisis then is understood as you know a failure to reflect a failure to take into account it's a very interesting understanding of what constitutes a crisis because it's also structural and conceptual at the same time then by the time we get to the colonial era many Southeast Asians were writing about crisis you know uh, and how they understood crisis in the context of the 18th and 19th centuries if um, we read the writings of people like uh, Munshi Abdullah Abdul Qadir, uh, a very important writer who lived in Malacca and Singapore during the period of British colonial rule. Uh, Munshi Abdullah also, you know, uh, was worried about the crisis of his time in the 19th century. And that crisis for him was a crisis of timeliness, the loss of time, lack of time, not enough time. Munshi Abdullah was writing, of course, at the time when um, the East India Company and the forces of colonial capital were radically changing, you know, practically every aspect of, you know, 
Southeast Asian life, uh, while Southeast Asians themselves were lagging further and further behind in the race for knowledge, of technology, of science, of capital. And so for him, a crisis was a crisis of timeliness, not enough time. You know, we are running out of time, we are behind time. And for him, you know, the remedy to that, the solution to that would be to regain time through the acquisition of knowledge, including colonial knowledge. By the time we get to the 20th century, when we look at uh, the writings of some of the um, nationalist uh, thinkers and activists and, and political leaders uh, before World War II, uh, we can see in the writings of people like Burhanuddin al-Hilmi or Ibrahim Yaqob or even people like um, Haji Omar Sari Jukro Aminato, uh, writings of Sukarno, a sense of, of another type of crisis altogether. The crisis then was the division, the political division of maritime Southeast Asia, what was once known as you know, um, the Malay world of the Malay archipelago, had been divided as a result of the uh, treaties that were signed by the various colonial powers, notably Britain and Holland, but also France, Spain and Portugal, and later America. And so as a result of that, this unified world of Southeast Asia had been divided into you know, um, different zones of different colonial power, uh, thereby bringing about a rupture, a kind of a imperial colonial divorce uh, between communities that were once in very close contact with one another. So it's another understanding of crisis. Here the crisis is that of political geographic division and the remedy was to remember, to remember in both senses of the word, to recall a common collective, you know, shared history, but also to remember, to bring back together the broken body of maritime Southeast Asia into um, perhaps a larger, you know, uh, collective political unit, uh, the dreams of uh, creating a post-colonial Southeast Asia where these colonial borders uh, would be erased or overcome. So basically every generation goes through you know, its own crisis and if you look at Southeast Asia today, I think what we are seeing, apart from the very genuine, very real and very serious problem of the pandemic itself, is a kind of collective anxiety among a lot of Southeast Asians, especially younger Southeast Asians who perhaps you know, are worried that their dreams of a better life in a Southeast Asia that is connected, you know, have been brought to an end by the disruptive effects of this pandemic. Because in recent history, uh, most Southeast Asians would recall that from the 80s to the 90s, you know, this was the region that was dubbed, you know, the region of the Asian tiger economies. Our economic uh, success in the 80s meant that you know Southeast Asia became rapidly urbanized we began to see upward social mobility uh, the younger generations of Southeast Asians were having better lives than their parents uh, we had uh, uh, practically eradicated illiteracy in many parts of Southeast Asia and there was the belief that guided by you know capital driven development uh, southeast asia would be able to to not only succeed economically but more importantly you know develop a sense of a southeast asian identity uh, where there would be freedom of movement uh, ample opportunities uh, for, for social mobility and professional mobility and even geographical mobility. One of the great achievements of Southeast Asia was to allow for freedom of movement among all the citizens of the member states of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Now, all of that have, has been you know, um, arrested for now, you know, uh, as a result of the pandemic. Now, after decades of work and struggle and labor to bring about this interconnected Southeast Asia for the first time the millennial generation of Southeast Asians uh, realized that you know they are no longer able to cross borders they are no longer able to, to, to travel freely and so with that comes a whole set of other anxieties that add on to the problem of the pandemic itself so while the pandemic the virus itself is a major concern for all the states of Southeast Asia and should be dealt with accordingly, you know, through collective effort among all the member states of Southeast Asia, I think at the deeper level we are also seeing, you know, um, a host of anxieties and worries and concerns that are communicated, you know, through 
the lens of this pandemic. The pandemic, therefore, has become our collective metaphor. It's become a collective question. It's making us ask ourselves, you know, what has happened to the dream of, you know, a prosperous and, and, and connected Southeast Asia. So, apart from being a health problem, it has become, uh, I think, a source of existential angst for a lot of Southeast Asians who perhaps for the first time are asking themselves, you know, will they be able to have lives that were better than their parents. And I think this is a deep concern, a, a serious concern that has to be addressed. However, I think we must remember that, you know, whether in Southeast Asia or in any part of the world, crises have never been new. We've always had to live with crisis. We've always had, every generation has a crisis of its time. So I think this is an occasion for us to reflect on the historicity of crises in general and how crises in general are generational and always historical.